I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, um, Esther Charlesworth. Um, she's a founding director of Architects Without Frontiers and also a senior research fellow at RMIT. Um, her work engages directly with the proposition that sustainable design practice is an effective response um, in humanitarian crises, and this work has taken her around the world, most particularly through the Asia-Pacific in Sri Lanka, um, Vietnam, and also in remote outback Australia. Esther. Tonight, I will be arguing that by questioning the architect's fetish with utopian or ideal cities, and illustrating design projects and emerging roles for architects in what I term as the real city, that the state of the world and the state of design might forge a closer reality. My presentation cha challenges the fallacy that there is the ideal city for us, the Bobos or Bohemian bourgeois, I think they're called, the Paris, the San Gimignanos, the Londons, and the South Bank, and the Brisbans, that is for us the 10%. And a real city for them, or those out there, the Lagoses, the Bangkoks, the Mexico cities, and the Logans of this world. And then the ideal architect for the ideal city, the popular notion of the architect in the role of hero and celebrity icon, and then somehow that there's a kind of other architect for everybody else, for the other 90%. And perhaps um, there are some ideas in two roles that I'll be speaking about briefly tonight. The architect is humanitarian, and borrowing from CJ Lim, but just putting a different word in, the architect is climate change war warrior. We're now in the middle of the largest migration in human history, with over a third of humanity moving to seek new homes in cities. Doug Saunders labels these burgeoning urban centres as arrival cities, transitional spaces where the next financial booms and busts and explosions of violence will occur. So we see here the south LA's of this world the Mumbai's, the Kreuzberg and the Shenzhen's, where in less than one generation you go from mud floor to Eames chairs. Closely linked to the arrival city genealogy are what I call cities on the edge of urban breakdowns. And with more than 15 years living and working in most of these cities, I've witnessed firsthand how cities can quickly be transformed from thriving metropolises to dystopic shards shattered by floods, famine, ethnic conflict, conflict and violence. And these are just some of my own experiences. In Beirut, one night, I'm dancing till dawn in a funky architect-designed underground bunker. The next day, my neighbour's house is levelled and I'm evacuated on a ship for Cyprus in yet another invasion. In Belfast, one day, I'm admiring how European Union money can underwrite sophisticated sophisticated urban design projects in the city, and the next I watch architects advise the military on the design of so-called peace walls to keep the designed to keep the apartheid system of separating Catholics and Protestants well alive. In New York, whoops. All right, back to New York. Early one morning, I'm running along Battery Park City and think, wow, what an amazing city. And an hour later, 500 metres from the World Trade Centre, I'm sitting in a friend's apartment, watching two silver birds blow into dust, hoping that this was just another episode of Blade Runner. A close cousin of these cities on the edge of nervous breakdowns are the cities of disasters, familiar to us all. New Orleans, a city that went from famous to flooded only five years ago. Banda Aceh, devastated by the 2005 tsunami. So all of these cities, and there are a lot more, urban centres whose misfortune of geography, geography rendered them mere skeletons of their former glories, 
quite often in less than 24 hours. So it's a really a no-brainer here tonight to suggest that these cities on the edge of breakdowns or disasters are both rapidly growing in number and not spatial or social anomalies. They are, are in fact becoming the norm and yet we are still dreaming and designing for the ideal city. Enough of the bad news. Although cities have been destroyed throughout history, shaken, burned, bombed and starved, they have almost in every case risen again like the mythic phoenix. The question more relevant here tonight is what role can architects play in this urban resurgence? Assuming, if you agree with me, that globalisation and technology have mobilised our profession to work for any client, city, any time, anywhere in the world, and which leads me to architects' roles again in this real city. The architect is humanitarian and the architect is climate change warrior. The architect is humanitarian could perhaps best be summed up through a story from an architect friend of mine in New York City, Fred Schwartz, who labels himself a Robin Hood architect, taking from the rich to finance giving to the poor. Before Hurricane Katrina, Fred was in the big-time league of celebrity architects. He ran Venturi's office for more than a decade before establishing his own office in the 1990s and officially winning this World Trade Centre competition before the Liebskin media machine took over. In the last five years, however, Fred and his office have committed 50% of their time working on new housing projects in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina and developing this, a recovery master plan for New Orleans. So it's not either or saving the world or running a sexy design office, but considering social justice as pivotal to mainstream design practice. This emerging practice of humanitarian design can be illustrated through more than 30 design not-for-profit agencies I've witnessed over the last two decades. I'll briefly detail four practices and with their projects illustrate that this kind of design practice does not need to be formless, hippie architecture. They also show that combining aesthetics with ethics on minuscule budgets can produce heroic architecture, but without necessarily the architect as hero. Architects Without Frontiers is one of the first Australian design not-for-profit agencies set up over the last 10 years. Um, and I'll briefly show six of our projects that um, are either built or shortly to be built, just to give you a brief glimpse um, of the very modest and mini scale that we work on. Um, here we see a series of what are known as Anganwadi or preschools. We've built 10 in a large slum area in the centre of Ahmedabad with local Indian volunteers and Australian design volunteers who go over for a month at a time. With Sam Crawford Architects in Sydney, um, a project to be built next year is an AIDS clinic and youth centre in Malawi. Four years ago, we were asked to design an orphanage for 60 war widows and orphans in Kabul. It was done by uh, a volunteer architect from Sydney and then built in Kabul. Three months later, no planning permit was needed. And then in partnership with the City of Melbourne after the Boxing Day tsunami in 2005, we undertook three civic infrastructure projects, two mobile libraries, in the southern cities of Gaul and Hambantota, and building a school um, that uh, the nearby school had been swept away by the tsunami, so they quickly, within two days, needed to relocate 500 students, and within three months, this project was built. More recently, in the last two years, we've been asked to do an increasing amount of work for remote Indigenous communities in the Northern Territory. Uh, one of these projects in the middle is the Man and Greta Art Centre that was done in partnership with an architectural firm in the Northern Territory. And finally, a project that is just being completed now, again in a slum area, just as you come in from the airport in Cape Town, 
a community centre that has been um, funded by the Shuster Foundation and built out of sandbags um, by local women and children. Architects Without Frontiers, I think, and perhaps a lot of people in this room, our work was inspired by the very well-known rural, rural studio started up by Samuel Mockby 20 years ago at Auburn University to improve the living conditions in rural Alabama while imparting practical experience to architecture students. And I think this project is interesting. It's known as the $20,000 House, which seeks to address the pressing need for decent and affordable housing and producing a series of templates for housing in this very poor area of rural Alabama and housing that's seen as a viable alterna alternative to a trailer park home, which is in the region of seventeen dollars or $18,000. So trailer park home or a roof overhead. Um, not sure which one I'd prefer, but I, I think it might be this. Just a few other projects that have just captured my imagination. Also in the southern USA, Anderson Architects have designed what they call the alluvial sponge comb in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. And this has been designed to replace the cumbersome technology of embankments and flood walls. And the idea is that the combs can also be used as urban furniture. The final project I'll show here in this suite um, is that of Project H's, what they're called hippo water rollers, originally designed 15 years ago by two South African men as water transporting devices to reduce the labour of women and children spending most of their days carrying water. There are 30,000 rollers now in use um, that service approximately 200,000 people. The third typology of broken cities could be seen as a city of the eco breakdown. Um, and I'd like to quickly illustrate just through one example how clearly architects are beginning to think beyond sustainability as a house with solar panels and water tanks as a much bigger urban system. Um, and this project or planning strategy is called Plan NYC that's been spearheaded by New York City's Mayor Michael Bloomberg ostensibly to um, massively reduce the CO2 rate over the city in the last 10 years through some quite radical actions. Here's an image, um, was actually I think on the cover of Vanity Fair a few years ago, of Manhattan underwater and perhaps to prevent um, this scenario actually happening. The strategy um, is really built on four premises. That is avoiding sprawl, and I think that's the most interesting one, where every planning strategy currently of every Australian city is almost, although they say otherwise, to uh, encourage sprawl. Here, they're devising um, tax strategies to actually bring in more residents into the centre of Manhattan. <coughs> And to illustrate what the physical form implications of Plan NYC might actually be, there's also been a master plan strategy completed on Palisade, Palisade Island on the edge of um, Manhattan, Manhattan here, where a consortium of architects and landscape architects have got together and to devise a strategy of what they call soft architecture as a defence strategy against climate change. They say that the components of this soft infrastructure are clusters of constructed islands within the harbour, restored piers and constructed wetlands along the harbour perimeter. In just bringing perhaps some of these very disparate ideas together and in bringing the idea of the architect as humanitarian with the architect as climate change warrior, I've been thinking more and more about the architect as an urban pathologist and proposing what I'm calling the Marshall II Plan for the reconstruction of cities destroyed by natural or man-made disasters. Most of you would know about the original Marshall Plan that pumped something like $12 billion into post-World War II Europe as a model for post-conflict humanitarian aid. Now, the aim of this plan um, might be to involve architects and urban planners along health, technical and logistics experts in the rebuilding of severed cities and communities after wars, floods, fires and quakes. 
Architects then become more than the dreamers of prefab housing solutions. They become the urban pathologists of disaster, diagnosing and prescribing appropriate design solutions for the post-disaster city. On a local level, and on a final note, in a very brief survey I've done of current urban planning visions of three Australian cities, it seems amazing that the Melbourne 2030, the Sydney 2030, and the Brisbane 2020, 2026 city plan seem to be dominated by bullet points and blue sky policies and do not deal in any real de detail with the physical implications of climate change on urban form. For example, how does the current urban design vogue for compact cities affect ambient outdoor temperatures or the heat island effect? And while there are many examples of green commercial, residential and civic buildings, I would argue that all of them could be considered re relics by the middle of this century in the proliferating natural disaster so scenarios of violent storm surges, sea level rises and heat waves. So, where is Brisbane's real city vision of not allowing South Bank to become an island? Grey Street, a river? Queen Street Mall, a creek? And here in this fine building? Tim, will this become one of the most beautiful aquariums in the world? Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Um, and finally this evening, well, not quite finally, um, I'd like to introduce um, Sir Peter Cook, who is a primary agent provocateur and, and has spent the last 40, maybe 50, would I be so bold, years, um, speculating, writing, teaching, and now finally building in his new um, latest incarnation as Crab Studio. Peter. I'll spare you the pictures. I, I'm going to hold fire on the pictures till Wednesday night when I do the Nielsen lecture. And I will do just a, a little sort of observation coming from the privileged north. I think that in my career, I've observed many different architectural statements and architectural solutions. I think that as I look back, one of the things that irritates me most in, at this moment in history is that the majority of architects, particularly developers' architects, but it also applies elsewhere, are still using fundamentally the same typologies as our fathers and grandfathers did. In other words, they still, you know, both the people who taught the people who taught me, who were probably socialist modernists, believed that everything should go in neat categories of the home, the workplace, and then the workplace as office block, and the downtown as downtown. And it's interesting that, that though their political objectives were different and they, they had very high-minded objectives, the quick buck developers, even now, most of them, with the odd exception, uh, think of the workplace, how you can make a quick buck out of it, selling homes, how you can make a quick buck out of it, the downtown as a useful device for holding them. Uh, very curious, that, 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 that from these two different ends, we still have these outdated typologies, whereas, you know, it, when we were doing Archigram, when we were proposing that computers might be useful, we were also captured by the notion that a computer needed an enormous, great, bloody great concrete floor because it was a mainframe computer. We didn't even think of this doing the trick or perhaps, you know, in, in a very short space of time, something implanted in your earlobe will, will do the trick. And so what is interesting is that we have, we're stuck with these typologies. We're stuck with the typological thinking 
I sometimes have the privilege, or maybe not privilege, of seeing various master plans, uh, acting as a critic, sometimes as a juror, for various master plans. And the master plans that I see in the main, maybe not the ones that were discussed this evening, but the master plans in the main are to do with geometries, which are filled in again by this kind of same typological thinking. That's where that will go. That's where that will go. And then waiting for the disaster, which in a roundabout way uh, is not the way one wants to question them, but perhaps might be good for them. And I feel that this is all incredibly narrow-minded and plodding and, and just it's, it's a sort of hardening of the arteries of, of the state of architecture. So perhaps one returns to one's youth and says, you know, why was it that we were interested in anti-cities and non-houses and non-vehicles or vehicles that were perhaps furniture or non-furniture that was perhaps house? Perhaps those objectives sound a little bit quaint, but they were at least an instinctive attitude towards, not, towards what we would now call thinking outside the box. And perhaps as some of the speakers have suggested the tragedy of survival forces basic thinking. I, as a child, for part of my childhood, lived in Letchworth, the first garden city. And I lived in a house where the, the notion was that you, should, you could grow enough food to support the family. And at that point, because it was shortly after the Second World War, one was growing enough food support, to support the family before the Sainsbury's and the Waitrose's and the, and the various uh, supermarkets got really going. I, am a ch I was a child in the war, and we were a country surrounded by hostile ships. And we still lived. I had dried bananas as a luxury, dried egg, as a speciality, and a little amount of meat. And, and because we knew a farmer, one managed to get a little bit more milk. And I seemed to be taller than my predecessors, though my son is now taller than me. Um, it forced the English agricultural system to be extremely, extremely efficient. It was at that time able to support what was it, whatever the population was, maybe 45 million or 50 million at the time. Now, of course, we're all sloppy and we, we fly strawberries in from wherever they may be and we, we don't grow cabbages in the gardens. And I am privileged. Actually, I live two, two streets away from C.J. Lim. It's all very local here. And, and both he and Martin were students of mine. But I will, will avoid. So we're really a series of locals with slightly different views, perhaps. And our garden, and we do have a garden, is full of foxes and trees but very few vegetables. There's no vegetable growing in the whole of the privileged piece of inner London that we live in. We are talking about planting some vegetables now because we're, we're bored looking at, <laughs> looking at foxes who will probably eat them. But living in lecturers and being a war child gives you a sort of rounded view. I'm not saying that it is, one wants to go back to that. The other thing that has happened to one, of course, is that one travels. And what is very interesting I think, when you travel, is that you equate people who you have met, who you've taught, and I've had probably 20,000 students or something like that. You go to their city, and you see them in situ. You see the responses that they are making. And if they're good, they're probably reacting against the things that you taught them. If they're intelligent, they're probably looking again at their own environment, their own city, their own culture, their own language, their own resources, in ways that were not taught to them. Maybe the teaching, though, if it was perverse enough, just got them thinking. But you don't want them to do what you tell them to do or, or suggested. You want them to just, you know, think outside the box again. I'm, I'm surrounded, of course, by people who are younger than myself. But the thing that I found, as a, if I wear my academic hat, is that many of the best academies included, certainly some of the, the best American academies, some of the best European academies, are still talking about theory. They're obsessed by theory. They're obsessed by knowing the rules, knowing to admire 
the right kinds of architects, whoever they may be. And even if you're on the receiving end of that from time to time, it still worries you that, that that's not what it's about. What is not taught in architecture schools is how to use common sense. You know, 93 ways with the Swiss Army knife might be much, much more useful than learning, learning from Baudrillard. And ingenuity. Again, to go back to the war, one, one used ingenuity in 19 ways you could make, you know, dried egg interesting. Uh, what is the architectural equivalent of that? 23 ways in which you can use a brick. You know, the old, little, old, out of fashion exercise where you had a piece of paper and a brick and the point was to hold the brick up with a piece of paper. I think those things are not so bad. You know, a bit of, bit of sort of boy scouting. A bit of what do you do if your garden floods? I think it's a wonderful thing. I think we should all do the exercise of flooding our garden. What does that mean? Might not be a bad thing, you know? Might not be a bad thing at all. You grow some veg that grows in water. Why not? And so I think I have a funny list of things. That <laughs> I just wrote it as I was sitting here. Um, I thought, let's think about water. I love water. I'm, I'm tomorrow, no, so it's Wednesday night. I'm going to show some things about marshland because marshland fascinates me. It, you know, so we are going to go f being flooded. Might not be a bad thing might give a few people rheumatism, but, but it might not be a bad thing at all. We start thinking about movement in a different way. We grow bigger feet and, and you know, build boats. It's not necessarily a bad thing. What about water, water's edge? And this is then coming right into Brisbane. I think that the great thing about Brisbane is that you do have that water. Now, whether you're doing the right thing in it, and I, I love to... I love Tim's stuff, you know, it's, it's, it's both ironic and there's, you know, 90% irony and 10% actually sort of roundabout, naughty common sense. I love that. I thought it was amazing. And so, you know, this town is about water. Actually, that's what it's about. That's what makes it different. I, I lived here for five weeks, many, many yonks ago, and it was full of bugs, Never knew about bugs before. Never knew about cane toads and things that slip and possums that landed on the roof. And I was privileged enough to rib, live in a Brit Anderson house. And she, of course, was, was I think, Tim's teacher. So it's all a bit of a circle. Um, and what about wood? I don't mean necessarily, you know, your hardwood or your softwood, but, but the, 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 the fibrous thing that is stuff that's long and can be cut. All, all, all the woods of the world. You know, I, I, I have just, in late in life, I'm doing a building which is going to be largely covered by wood. In Vienna, of all places, where we do not particularly have the wood, but we have the wood nearby. And, and, you know, so water and wood, I think it's a lot of thinking, because I was brought up on steel and concrete and not really liking brick. Um... I'm even slightly taking to brown rice, as long as it's interesting. <laughs> what about privacy? Because in the city, we're supposed to do corporate things. I think that the, the typical office life is desperate. It is both unprivate and procedural. You know, I, 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 I think it's tragic that even in Spain now, they are abandoning the long lunch and the siesta. They're going into the American sandwich thing, the thing where I, where I go into certain offices that I have dealings with, and I see these guys sitting behind computer screens. They're not actually necessarily doing a great deal. As long as they are seen to be sitting behind the screen, that will do. There's something tragic about that. And I think cities are both about the opportunity to rub shoulders with people that in the countryside you might not, and that is still their benefit because certainly in the UK and probably in many other places, you can have many of the informational advantages of the city but not be living in a city. You can have a lot of the educational advantages. You can have a lot, certainly, you know, better air, etc. But, you know, every, to some extent, not everywhere, but many places are city, though they do not necessarily have, you know, streets running down the middle of them. But there is the question 
of rubbing shoulders. And cities are important about rubbing shoulders. And I think the mix of cities are important. And those same typologies, in many cases, are devised to prevent us from rubbing shoulders. When I go to Houston now, which I used to think of the sort of spread city, now it's full of these walled conditions. You have your, your car opens, the gate, you drive in, the wall shuts, and you live above it. So the typologies are acting to keep us from rubbing shoulders. The other thing I want to finish on, uh, though it doesn't send a message, but it just occurred to me, is boredom. I think one of the other things, if all of you guys who are dealing with problem architecture, don't make us bored. I think the typological guys made us bored. If you actually lived in a Hilbersheimer city, if you actually lived in a very, you know, good city, if you only mix with the people that speak the same language, come from the same socioeconomic group, you know, went to the same college, might you not get bored? My career has been about playing with, I think, ingenuity and trying to avoid people being bored. I don't know whether the two ex-students of mine sitting in the front row were bored or not. I suspect they might not have been bored, otherwise they wouldn't still be talking to me. But I think boredom is something that we never talk about as architecture, as architects. There's the sort of physical boredom, so it makes some of us prefer fruity architectures, non-fruity architectures, but I don't really mean that. There are those terrible manuals that I when I was first working in the architect's office, had to, to work to, which suggested that in the United Kingdom, you know, 93% of males who had needed to shave were shaving at a, a, a period between, I don't know, 8.15 and 8.35. But when television sets started to come in, there were these diagrams that suggested that granny usually sat there and the youngest usually sat there. And it's, again, this sort of box-like thinking. I think there is a boredom that we have created around our profession. I will show some pictures of a building in Bayacas um, in Madrid, which it's unusual for me to have a tall building emerging, but it is now up to the top and beginning to be clad, where we are doing social housing that has sport activity on the top, and lifts itself off the ground so that people can come and build kiosks and shanties and what the hell they want to. I suspect we will be unpopular amongst the other architects because all the other buildings in Vayaka seem to be coming four square down onto the ground and there seem to be lots and locks, lots of locks and keys. One can only do what one can do, but one, like many architects in the past, one likes to try to make the buildings that you do talk about these broader issues. The prototype, as I think was hinted by Tim again, the prototype is still a valued thing and it it would be a very good idea if these prototypes could be made to talk to each other and, and vie with each other. I'm absolutely with you on that. Thank you.